In this part of discriminant analysis, we're going to go behind the stage or under the hood and look at a fundamental concept called statistical distance, which is heavily used in discriminant analysis. Let us first recall how discriminant analysis works. The idea is to look at each one of the classes. In this example, we have four classes. Compute the center of each class, and then measure the distance of the record of interest from the center of each one of the classes. We then classify this record as the class that is nearest, that has the nearest centroid. In this video, we're going to concentrate on measuring the distance. How do we measure this distance between a record and a class center? Of course, we can use lots of different distances. So let's start very simple and then move on to eventually what we're going to call statistical distance. We're going to use the same personal loan offer example that we saw in the first video. And just remember that the bank used data from a previous campaign where they sent out the offer to 5,000 customers and 480 of them accepted the offer. The variable of interest here, the outcome, is whether the customer accepted or rejected the offer. So let's start with a very simple distance, which is Euclidean distance. And let's start with the simplest case where we have only a single predictor. And suppose that we're looking at CC average, which is the credit card average spending. Suppose that we have a customer with CC average value of 2.70. How far is this customer from the center of the non-acceptors class? How far is this customer from the acceptors class? Well, in this case, it's quite easy. What we need to do first is compute the CC average for the non-acceptors, and that turns out to be 1.73. And then we'll compute the CC average for the acceptors class, and that turns out to be 3.91. Remember that this number is an average of 480 numbers. And then we can measure how far this customer's predictor 2.70 value is from each one of these numbers. In Euclidean distance, we simply take the absolute difference, or if we want, we can take the square difference. So if I'm comparing the distance of this customer from each one of the classes, I see that the closer class center is the non-acceptors. But how about the standard deviation? We didn't take that into account at all when we were computing the Euclidean distance. Notice, for example, that the non-acceptor standard deviation is much smaller. In other words, the spread of credit card spending among the non-acceptors is smaller than among the acceptors. We would want to take that into account conceptually. So how do we do this? Is there a method that you know that can help us incorporate the standard deviation into a Euclidean distance? Let's move on to more predictors. Suppose that now we're not only looking at the credit card average spending, but we're also including the age of the customer and their income. So we have a profile with three predictor values. Again, we can compute the centroid for the non-acceptors and similarly for the acceptors. To compute the Euclidean distance in this case, all we need to do is use the ordinary Euclidean distance formula, where we subtract 2.70 from 1.73, Separately, we subtract 44 and 45.37 and 100 from 66.24. We then square each one of these differences, and finally, we can take a square root. This gives us the Euclidean distance of this customer from the centroid of the non-acceptors class. We can do the same for the acceptors class, and what we find is that this customer is closer to the non-acceptors class. When we take into account the credit card average spending, their age and income. Now look for a moment at these two computations at the bottom. Is there anything that looks a little bit strange about them? Is there anything that bothers you? There's another small problem with Euclidean distance hiding in these equations at the bottom. Well, we noticed earlier on that we have a problem because Euclidean distance does not take into account the variance or the standard deviation. And we do want to take into account the spread because I might be closer to the center, but if the cloud is much wider and bigger, I should take that into account. Another problem is that we did these computations for each one of these variables separately. 
We took a difference for age, we took a difference for income, but each one of these variables was on a different scale. So adding up these differences that are on different scales sounds somehow wrong. The third problem with Euclidean distances is that when we have multiple predictors, such as in the second example that I showed you, we ignored any correlations between these predictors. And we know that if we draw two variables in a scatter plot and there's some correlation, the cloud will look different from no correlation. And positive correlation will look different from negative correlation. So we just need to remember that Euclidean distance has all these three challenges. We might be able to fix some of them, but not all of them. For example, we might be able to tackle the issue of standard deviation by using z-scores instead of the raw data. For scale, we might be able to rescale all the variables. But correlations are not easy to tackle with Euclidean distances. So the solution is using something called statistical distance, also known as Mahalanobis distance. If you search for Mahalanobis on Google, you'll find the Wikipedia page that describes him as an Indian scientist and applied statistician best remembered for the Mahalanobis distance, a statistical measure. Mahalanobis was also the person who started the famous Indian Statistical Institute in India. So let's look at the statistical distance that he invented. First of all, what is going to be fundamentally different between this distance and Euclidean distance? One way to think about it is thinking about looking at a map, distances on a map, aerial distances, versus actually looking at a contour map where you're taking into account the altitudes. When we're doing Euclidean distance, we're basically computing things such as aerial distances. Whereas when we're looking at statistical distance, we're going to take into account the whole terrain of the predictor distributions. Let's now look again at a certain customer that has a profile x0, which means a series of different predictor values. And let's show how we can measure the distance of this customer from the acceptor's center. With Euclidean distance, what we did was simply take each one of the three values and subtract the average of the acceptor's class. We looked at the credit card spending average, the average age, and the average income in the acceptor's class. We can write this very long equation in a much shorter form that will allow us to expand this to as many predictors as we like. We're using here what's called vector notation or matrix notation. X0 is the vector or the list of the values in the profile for the customer of interest. X bar accept is the list of averages of the predictors in the acceptors class. And the T up here is transpose. It means that instead of writing the list in the form of one on top of the other, we're writing them one next to each other. If you're not familiar with matrix notation, you can skip this and just try and understand the concept. Here's what's going to be different when we do statistical distance. Now we're not going to be computing aerial distances, but we're going to actually be climbing the mountains and taking the terrain into account. Here's the formula. Instead of simply looking at the differences between each and every one of the predictor values and the class average, we're also going to account for variances and correlations by incorporating this matrix called S. S is the covariance matrix between all the predictors and themselves. This means that in this matrix, the diagonal will have all the variances. Off the diagonal, we're going to have covariances between every pair of predictors. This means that statistical distance takes into account not only the distances in terms of centroids, but also variances and correlations. Let me show you how I compute the distance for the simple example that we had before. Here's the customer we were interested in, and I'm writing their x0 in a notation that is matrix notation. I have the three values of 2.7, 44, and 100 stacked one on top of the other. This is a vector. Then we have the centroid of the acceptors group. The third thing that we need is this covariance matrix or covariance table. You can compute this simply even using Excel. And what we see here is that we have on the diagonal the variances of income, of credit card spending, and of age. Off the diagonals, we have the covariance between credit card spending and income, age and income, etc. These are the three components that we need to compute the statistical distance. Next, we're going to combine them together 
using the formula that we saw in the previous slide. Here's the formula. Here is the first vector, x0. Here is the centroid for the acceptors. And the reason I'm writing them in row notation rather than columns is because of this transpose up here. This gives us the vector of differences, which we computed before for the Euclidean distance. Next, I'm looking at the covariance matrix, and I'm taking an inverse of this matrix. I can compute this inverse by using Excel's M inverse, or you can use any other software that you like. Finally, I'm going to take this difference vector, multiply it by the inverse matrix, and finally multiply it by the vector in standing form. The final result is 15.22. I take a square root of this number and I get the statistical distance of 3.9. This is the distance of our customer from the centroid of the acceptors group. Next, what we would do is do the same computation for measuring the distance of the same customer from the non-acceptors group. That would give us another number. We would then classify this customer to either the acceptors or non-acceptors group based on the closer class in terms of statistical distance. Now, when we run software, they don't typically give us statistical distances. What they give us are our classification scores. We've seen that in the previous video. In fact, there's a very clear relationship between the statistical distance and the classification scores. If you remember, the classification scores are proximity scores. So larger numbers mean that you're closer to that group. If you want to see the math, here's what we had before for the statistical distance. We can open the brackets and write it out in more detail, and then write out the formula for classification scores in discriminant analysis. You'll notice that this is, in fact, very similar to the statistical distance formula. This special form helps us with incorporating interesting and useful information, such as misclassification costs, which we'll see in the third video. The main point here is to remember that discriminant analysis uses statistical distance, that software will typically give us classification scores, but those are essentially very similar to statistical distances. To summarize, linear discriminant analysis classification functions are based on computing statistical distance. The statistical distance, unlike the Euclidean distance, accounts for all three location, size, and shape of the class clouds. In other words, the centroids, the spread, and the correlation, the relationship between the predictors. You notice that we did an inversion of the matrix S. And this matrix inversion can be expensive, especially when you have many predictors. That's why discriminant analysis is very easy and useful with small samples, but with very large numbers of predictors, it might take a long time to compute. Let's remember one thing important about this discriminant analysis approach. This is what we call a model-based classifier because we actually have equations behind the scenes and then we use the data to estimate those equations. When we have a model-based classifier, there typically are assumptions behind the scenes. Let's find out what are the assumptions in this case. Two major assumptions are that the joint distribution of the predictors is normal. And number two, the correlations between the predictors are the same for each class. In our example, we'd expect the covariance matrix for the acceptors group to be the same as the one for the non-acceptors group. Let's look at these assumptions in a little more depth and figure out whether their violation is going to be dangerous. This multivariate normality of the predictors means that if this is reasonably met, discriminant analysis is going to be efficient compared to other methods. Efficient means that we don't need a lot of data to get the model right. The good news is that even when we're violating this, and one classic place when we're violating this is when our predictors are dummy variables, which clearly cannot be normal variables, it turns out that discriminant analysis actually works pretty well. And that's an interesting discovery. So don't discard discriminant analysis if you have predictors that are not necessarily normal. The second assumption has to do with a correlation with, between predictors within each class. And we want that covariance or correlation matrix to be the same when we look at different classes. This one is a little more dangerous to violate. And therefore, to make sure that this is reasonably met, we're usually going to just glance at the covariance matrices 
for each one of the classes and make sure that they're not drastically different. If they are, then LDA is probably not a great idea, and there's a quadratic discriminant analysis version that might be used. Finally, a third assumption that is related to the normality, but is slightly different, is sensitivity to outliers. It turns out that discriminant analysis really doesn't like outliers. For that reason, it's useful to do some exploratory analysis beforehand and remove any outliers that might influence the analysis. To summarize, discriminant analysis is a model-based classifier. It uses statistical distance as the basis for computing scores. It does make a few assumptions. We noted robustness to the normality assumption, but sensitivity to outliers and the importance of equality of the covariance matrices. And when the assumptions are reasonably met, we can actually use discriminant analysis with small samples, which is not the case with more data-driven methods. Keep this in mind when you're thinking of using discriminant analysis.